Hi, it's Kayla, and today I wanted to talk about my experience and results getting genetic testing for retinitis pigmentosa. So first, I just want to talk about kind of what's the purpose of getting genetic testing, why I wanted to get it done, and why maybe you would want to get it done. So the number one reason why I wanted to get genetic testing is I wanted to know what the probability was that I could pass it on to my own children. This is something I would ask my eye doctor every single appointment probably since I was like 10 years old and they never had a straight answer. I was told 50-50 and I was also told one in a million, which is a really big difference between the two of those. So I really wanted to know what that probability was for sure. Another reason is that I wanted information on, I guess, just my specific strand of RP, like what symptoms are common or what the progression rate is for that specific strand. Um, genetic testing can also confirm a diagnosis, so that's another reason why people get it done. Also, getting genetic testing contributes to the pool of research, so the more people who get genetic testing done, the more information there is about rare genetic disorders. So I wanted to kind of, you know, contribute to that research. And then another reason why some people might want to get genetic testing done, which isn't something that I was interested in, but um, it can tell you if you are eligible for any clinical trials, like if you're wanting to do gene therapy, because in order to do gene therapy, you have to have the gene identified, in which case you have to do genetic testing. But again, not something that I was really interested in. Okay, so now let's talk about my experience doing the genetic testing. Well, actually, first, I want to let you guys know that the Foundation Fighting Blindness currently is doing free genetic testing for people in the U.S. with um, retinal diseases. I'm pretty sure they just mail you a tube, you spit in it, mail it back, and they call you with the results. Um, I will leave a link to information about that in the description box below if you're interested. I will say, though, if you are interested, you probably want to go ahead and do it because you never know when they might run out of funding. But at the time that I did genetic testing, um, I did it in August, the Foundation Fighting Blindness was only doing free genetic testing in specific states, and mine wasn't one of them, so I decided to go through my insurance and my local genetics clinic. So I called the genetics clinic and made an appointment, and this is something that I pursued on my own. It's not something that my eye doctor referred me for or suggested that I do. My eye doctor has always been very indifferent about genetic testing. Um, so I saw a lot of people online doing genetic testing and just decided on my own that I wanted to do it. So I made myself an appointment and um, I checked with my insurance to make sure that it was covered because genetic testing can be very expensive, like thousands and thousands of dollars um, and so I just wanted to make super sure that my insurance would cover it or that the out-of-pocket cost that I would be responsible for would be a reasonable cost. So I went to the appointment and met with a genetic doctor and they took a brief family history, which was kind of irrelevant in my case because no one in my family has any symptoms of what I have. And then we talked about which panel I wanted to do. So there's a big range in types and sizes of panels. You can do a panel that tests for like 30 genes, or you can do anywhere from a panel that tests for 900 genes, which is the one that I did. And I will add that the genetic doctor and the genetic counselor that I met with weren't a whole lot of help because they are experts on genetics they're not experts on retinal diseases, you know, and I don't blame them. You can't be an expert on every single genetic disorder because there are so many. So I felt like I kind of knew a little bit more about retinal disorders than they did. Um, and I would recommend that maybe if you're interested in doing genetic testing that you do some pre preliminary research and make sure you're informed and educated just in case the doctors that you meet with aren't very helpful. So essentially, I picked the large panel because um, if you test for a small amount of genes, since there's so many different genes that cause retinitis pigmentosa, if you test for only like 30 genes, there's a really good chance that they can't identify the gene because 
um, you didn't have one of those 30. Um, so I picked the biggest panel just to make super sure that they would find it because I didn't want to have to do this again. So I picked the 900 gene panel. Um, it is the retinal dystrophy expanded panel by Gene DX is the lab in case you're interested in that same panel. And for your information, in case you're interested, the Foundation Fighting Blindness uses the retinal dystrophy panel by Blueprint Genetics, and I think it tests for about 250 genes. So anyways, I picked my panel, they drew my blood, sent me on my way, and I waited about two months for my results. And in that time, I checked again with my insurance and the Gene DX lab and my genetics clinic and just cross reference with everyone just again to make super sure that it was covered because they were really giving me the runaround. It was a huge headache, but I wanted to make sure I didn't end up with like a $5,000 bill from this. So um, if you're planning on going through your insurance, I would check and recheck just, just to make sure. So about two months later, I got a phone call and they told me that they identified the gene and gave me very brief information about it, but they wanted me to come in for a face-to-face -face appointment to do the genetic counseling to go more in depth with the information. So I had to wait like another month and a half because they were all booked up. So I finally went in for my appointment and got my results and this is what they found. I have a mutation on both copies of my RDH12 gene and was diagnosed with Labor's congenital amaurosis type 13, which I will get more into that in just a second. So they consider this um, genetic disorder, um, I think it's autonomal recessive, um, which means that you have to have two non-working copies of the same gene in order to have symptoms of the disease. So what they theorize is that my parents were both unaffected carriers, which means they both had one bad copy of that gene and had no idea because since they just had one, they didn't have any symptoms of the disease and they both passed their bad gene on to me. And so I got two of them, and have the disease. And what that means for my own children is that the chances of them having the same vision impairment that I have is very, very, very slim. Since you have to have two non-working copies of the same gene, the only chance my kids would have of having this is if my husband was a carrier as well, which the odds of my husband being a carrier of the same rare disease that I have the odds are like astronomical, but we are having him tested just in case. Um, and since they've identified the gene in me, now they know exactly what gene to look for in him. But I'm really not worried about it. Like I said, the odds are extremely slim. So um, that was a big relief for us. We were really happy to hear that. Um, that that's not something that we have to worry about. And not that that would change our mind about having kids, but it's just good to have peace of mind to not have to worry about them having my vision impairment because there's a thousand other things to worry about when having kids. And so now that's not one of them. And I know there's no guarantee, like there could still be some freak genetic mutation with our child, or they could be premature and have retinopathy of prematurity. Like anyone could have a blind or visually impaired child, but now we know that our chances of that are just as low as the general population. Okay, so my specific disorder, Labor's congenital amaurosis type 13 or LCA, um, is something that I, I'm not going to say I've never heard of it because I've heard of I think some of you guys have that, um, but no doctor has ever diagnosed me with it, suggested that I have it. Like I've never heard that disorder um, in reference to me. So it was quite a surprise when they said, oh yeah, you have LCA. I was like, um, what? Like, are you sure? Um, so that was really surprising. Um, 
And again, the genetic counselor didn't really know a lot about LCA or retinal diseases in general. So most of my information is from my own research. So what I learned is that LCA is a more severe and early onset type of retinitis pigmentosa. It's usually apparent in infancy or early childhood. And this made a lot of sense to me because, um, you know, I've, I've been diagnosed for with retinitis pigmentosa for a long time, and it always felt like I was a lot blinder than most people who had it, and I had it so young um, that I always thought that I was just, I don't know, very unlucky with it. But now I know that I have this, um, you know, specific type, LCA, which it's it's common that it's more severe and has early onset, so I kind of fit the bill with that one. If you want more information on what exactly retinitis pigmentosa is and kind of the medical workings of that and symptoms, um, I did a video on that a while back that I will link below. So that part was accurate. However, there were a lot of symptoms of LCA that don't really apply to me. So for example, um, nystagmus, which is where your eyes shake, is very common with LCA, which I don't have that. Um, extreme light sensitivity is also really common, which I've only really been sensitive to really bright light in the past couple of years, but for most of my life, um, bright light never bothered me. I liked it. It was like the brighter the better because I could see better in it. I even had fluorescent lights in my bedroom. Um, so it's only started bothering me in the past couple of years. So most of my life, I didn't have that. Another symptom is um, intense like rubbing or poking, pressing of the eyes as a child, which can cause like the eyes to be kind of sunken in, which I never did that. Um, I think like cataracts and the eyes looking kind of cloudy is also common. There, there were quite a few things, pretty much other than severe visual impairment and early onset, all of the other symptoms of LCA I don't have and I've never had. So I thought that was kind of interesting and I was reading through and I was just kind of like, are they sure this is what I have? Um, but I guess it just goes to show that there's so much variance even in, you know, if you kind of narrow it down because retinitis pigmentosa is a very broad umbrella term that there's a lot of variance in, but even if you narrow it down to LCA, there's still a lot of variance. I think it would be helpful, I guess, to know more specifics about LCA type 13, but I could not find any information. Like I did a lot of Googling and, you know, asked the genetic counselor and I haven't really been able to find any genetic or any information about LCA type 13 specifically. So I don't know where to find that. If you know how to find that information, please let, let me know because I would be really interested. Um, oh, also I saw like conflicting information about um, if LCA is progressive or not. Some places said that it is progressive. Some places say that it's relatively stable. So I don't know, but I guess it doesn't matter because mine is progressive. So I guess it doesn't really matter what the research says it's supposed to do or not supposed to do because it's just, it's going to do whatever it wants to do regardless of if that's what the research says or if that's what symptoms you're supposed to have. So, um, yeah, I guess that part doesn't, doesn't really matter because it doesn't change anything. So I don't really know what I was expecting. I guess I was expecting kind of a an aha moment of where it would say, you have this type of disorder, which has all of these symptoms, and they would all apply to me like to a T, and I'd be like, oh, exactly, that's, that's me. That's, you know, this is what I have, and this is what my eyes are supposed to be doing. I guess that's kind of what it, I expected, and that's, that's not how it went. <laughs> So I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of more confused now about my eye disease than I was before I got the genetic testing. Um, I didn't really gain any clarity. I mean, other than the hereditary piece, I'm really glad that we got answers about that and that it was good news. But other than that, I feel like I didn't really 
gain anything, learn anything. I don't know. But I mean, I'm still glad that I did the genetic testing. So that's been my experience and my results. I would really love to hear from you guys. Have you gotten genetic testing? And if so, what was your experience like? I'd really like to know, did you have better luck than I did? Did you learn anything? I'd love to know all about your experience. Um, and if you so happen to have a genetic mutation on your RDH12 gene, or if you have LCA type 13, I would love to hear from you and hear about what, you know, your experiences with vision loss have been and just to connect. Um, and if you have LCA in general, I'd like to hear from you too and know what your experiences with your vision impairment have been. Um, and if you're considering getting genetic testing done, if you have questions, feel free to leave those in the comments below. And um, if you've gotten genetic testing and you have any advice to leave for other people, please leave that in the comments below. And um, I hope you guys like this video and I will see you next time.